I apologize in advance for the really bad slide styling. It's basic. I, I, I always find out, like, whenever I try to do something fancy, it gets really unreadable really fast. Um, okay, I think it's, it's time to start. So, um, hi, I'm Edmund, for those of you who haven't uh, met me. Um, just a few things about myself. I work at Slam Data on the Quasar Analytics uh, database engine, compiler, and, and, and the tooling as well. Um, for anyone unfamiliar with us, we do purely functional Scala all over our back end. We also use PureScript for all of our front end stuff, so we're not strangers to PureFP. It's kind of the norm for us. Um, I just want to talk about this kind of, I mean, I know that the talk title says Reader T. I'm going to touch on Reader T. Reader T is kind of important to what I'm going to say, but I'm starting to kind of, I'm trying to peel back the layers of this sort of general problem in the FP community, which um, has a sort of specific instance that's more technical that I can sort of address directly while sort of commenting a little bit on the general case. So here's the problem. Uh, secondary requirements for functional programs. Um, functional programmers and functional programs have this kind of reputation. If you're, I mean, everyone in this room probably knows what I'm talking about. Um, you know that everyone thinks, when some people think functional programmer, they think type astronaut, right? They think someone who's going to waste a long time abstracting something out, which isn't necessary to abstract out just because it's fun, um, just because it's, it's appealing. I mean, you know, functional programming is fun. It's great, but that kind of leads to temptation, right? So um, we, we fail to spend enough time sometimes on our secondary requirements, like our programs are sometimes slow, there's sometimes memory hogs. Sometimes they're not logged well. Sometimes they, they crash for you know, bad reasons. Sometimes they chug along when they should have crashed. Um, and sometimes they're really hard to modularize in certain dimensions, but the other dimensions we thought about all the time and we spend all of our time on. Um, so that's, that's sort of the problem I'm, tr I'm trying to get at here. Uh, and I think there's a few reasons for this. A lot of the examples that we use to teach people functional programming are sort of toys. Right, they're toys which are sort of useful at first, and then there's a footnote which says, by the way, if you actually want to use this, you need to do X, Y, and Z, which are completely different. Um, so that's a big problem because you know, extending beyond those examples is actually very difficult in general. Um, as well, you know, as, as I said, it's fun. Um, but I'm just going to try and, I'm not going to solve this problem. I'm not going to make functional programming boring either, which would definitely solve this problem. Um, but I'm going to try and give you an example of how to solve a problem without there being sort of toys involved, without there being sort of, this is fun, don't actually do it sort of thing. Um, so something I worked on lately. Um, a month or so ago, I was working on a, a server to run benchmarks for Quasar. So Quasar translates database queries into another database query language, and then we run the queries, and we want to see how fast those queries are. Um, so you need to benchmark that. That's crucial, right? So um, I thought it was just going to be a shell script or two at the start. Um, but as the requirements increased, I was just like, OK, I can't just wire up Python's simple HTTP server and Quasar and just you know, finagle some shell script and cron and all that stuff together. Um, I need a full Scala application, right? Um, so I, working at Slam Data, I thought, okay, let's do some pure FP. Let's bring out Scala. Let's bring out Scala Z. Let's bring out HTTP4S um, and get to work. So I did. So what goes into running benchmarks in general is just, firstly, you need to set up somehow. You need to um, bring up your system under test. You need to get the data you're actually going to use to run benchmarks, and then you need to run them, take the results, put them somewhere, and then clean up after yourself. Um, so uh, in general, uh, you, can, like, you might think of set up as reading test data from a file or starting a process, a clean up, killing processes, closing file handles, deleting files, um, and outputting as being, you know, you put your benchmark results up on S3, you put them up on a on some kind of remote storage, or you just print you print the results as well, so that the benchmark running person can see what you're actually what your results are. So, spoiler alert. Um, um, spoiler alert. It's all functions. 
setup is a value that's the only uh, you know special case but everything else right is running benchmarks is a function from your input data to some results run outputting your results is a function from results to some output thing uh, and cleanup is just a function from your setup data to something something which is going to perform your cleanup actions which you're and it's not going to produce a value that you want to use other than that so in Scala, you can kind of state this like this, right? Everything here is a, is a function. I've just named all the type parameters slightly differently so you can kind of see intuitively that there's like a way that makes sense to compose all of these functions, okay? So, so if, you're, if you're stuck on, I'm doing side effects, I'm not doing side effects, all of these are eventually going to be effects as values, but for now, I'm not even gonna focus on that. These are just functions. Um, so, uh, the thing about composing functions is that usually if you know different things about the types of those functions, you can compose them in different ways, right? Sometimes you can compose functions and you can reuse a function multiple times. Sometimes you can compose functions. You have these, a bunch of functions you want to compose, you only end up using a few of them. Um, sometimes you have to use all of them in a certain way. Uh, sometimes you have results in monads, that gives you extra options. You have inputs in comonads, other options. Um, in general, function composition is limited by how much you know about the functions, okay? So, uh, if you, the, the part of the key to writing good functional code is that you can't just write functions, you need to write functions with, which compose other functions, right? Because if you, if you do something like, um, I'm going to provide a benchmarking framework, okay? So the framework is, you give me all this stuff, I do some magical things, and then uh, at the end you get unit back, and I have done all the benchmarking. Right? That's the, the great thing about functional programming, is that you expose these higher order functions, and then people can use those to make their own higher order functions, and you can think of those higher order functions as the framework. The control flow is the framework, right? And this way, frameworks compose. I know, if you're a JavaScript dev, you're probably used to hearing, frameworks do not compose. No, frameworks compose fine, uh, because they're just functions. Um, so, uh, so this is kind of like the, the list principle where they say, okay, you have a bunch of data types, or no, you don't have a bunch, of, you have a few data types, and you have a bunch of operations on those data types. Instead, you have a few higher order functions and a bunch of functions that you could use with those higher order functions, which is what gives you the modularity and it gives you, gives you features, right? More functions, more features, more higher order functions, you have more frameworks. So. This is how I choose to compose all of the code inside uh, all those functions that I showed earlier to actually make a full benchmark run, right? We have setup, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna, everything is gonna be in a monad now because I'm, I'm gonna decide for myself, okay, every, what I'm gonna know about these functions is they re yield results in monads. Okay, they're effectful. So I'm gonna grab the setup, the start from the setup data, right? And then I'm going to push it into run bench benchmarks, and I'm going to push the uh, results from that into the output. And then I'm gonna yield the output, and then I'm gonna make sure that once I'm done all that, I have cleaned up properly, even if an error occurred during running benchmarks. Uh, and by the way, if you have any questions, especially if there's code on the screen, feel free to ask. So this, this I think is, is fairly Fairly, uh, fairly simple, fairly intuitive. This is the first framework we're going to see. It's going to change a little bit, um, but I, I'm going to reuse this as a sort of example. So back to secondary requirements, right? We're talking about logging. So I knew when I started working on the runner that a good command line tool should provide good logs. Um, Good logs, especially for long running tools like this, right? Benchmarks take a long time to run. Spark jobs take a long time to run. There's a lot of code that takes a long time to run that you can't afford to rerun in case it crashes or in case it does something wrong. Uh, you need to know immediately what it's done wrong. And I think there's a key to knowing what a program has done wrong in the logs, to logging properly so that people understand what's happening. And that is, you need to log what you're doing, right? I mean, this sounds kind of obvious. What else are you logging other than what you're doing, right? But you need to let the user know that, hey, I was in the middle of running benchmarks on this version of Quasar with this database, with this query in particular, and then this happened, right? You need context. You need to know what you were doing at the time that you were doing something else that you're going to log, right? So um, 
I need to know what it was doing, what it's doing right now, specifically because I need to know if it's stalled. I need to know if it's doing something wrong. I need to know what it's just done because if I don't know what it's just done, I don't know if it's already erred or if it's done something wrong. Um, I need to know very importantly what it was doing when it crashed, right? I mean, stack traces. That's the thing. I'll go in on stack traces later, right? But they're useless in Scala with with FP. Um, and, and so we need to kind of fake our own. We need to fake something that looks like that, but is useful to the user instead of being these functions were being called, right? So um, other than that, I also want to know um, I want to know what it hasn't done yet as well, just in case it's missing a step. Okay, so so uh, what does it mean to log what your program is doing, right? Um, in general. I mean, we, we have this idea of this, it's executing a function, okay? But what is it really doing, right? Uh, what does it mean for your program to be doing something, okay? The, I mean, it's built into the language, this idea of you're calling this function, which calls that function, which calls that function, right? And that's what's uh, being evaluated right now, okay? But the problem with that is that in functional programming, we have two notions which are separate. We have evaluation and execution. Right? And we don't, we don't care what's being evaluated. We don't care that someone is inside of an IO run loop, and then in there there's five stack frames that kind of tell you just a little bit about what it was doing. Um, we care about, OK, well, I was running benchmarks. I was, doing, I was starting up. I was doing this or that. Um, so that is why it's basically impossible to take your program, run it, and automatically derive what was my program doing. You need to say explicitly what was your program doing, um, because otherwise you're you're going to be entangled in. I mean, otherwise you're going to be entangled in all of these sort of default language constructs that you're going to use to encode what you're trying to do, especially in Scala. You're going to use them to encode something, but what it is you're encoding is lost in the process. So uh, there's a, there is an approach though which includes the stack trace with every log message. It's called MDC. It's in Java. It's uh, Log4j supports it. Uh, I wouldn't use it for this exact reason because, I mean, even if I wasn't writing functional code, uh, the stack trace is still too low on the, in, in terms of abstraction. It's not, low, it's not high level enough. I can't understand it, especially as a user. Um, and, and in functional Scala, in particular, you have just a few stack frames that tell you what threw an exception or what failed. And then the rest of it is all, uh, the, I, I was running I.O., or I was running task, or I was... Uh, interpreting a free monad or something, which tells you nothing at all about what you were doing. Um, so, the uh, when you when you debug something using stack traces, you're kind of reconstructing this information in your head, which is really difficult to do. In general, it's not possible. It costs you, you know, cycles in your brain because when you're debugging something, debugging is complicated, right? You need to be thinking about the problem. You can't be thinking about oh, well, I call this function in three different places, and maybe I was calling it from here, and I was doing that. Uh, you, can't, you can't do that. Um, so other than that, though, there's another problem, which is stack traces give you something that is nice. They give you, I called this function, and inside that, I called another function, right? The locations of, or, or what you're doing nests, it composes. You have, I was doing x, and while the, during that I was doing y, and then this failed, right? So we need to have, this is a requirement for us. If I'm going to implement this sort of notion of where was my code, I'm going to have to first say um, the places compose with each other, okay? So, um, because otherwise, it, otherwise you use code in multiple places, right? You use the same code multiple times, hopefully, um, and then if you, if you don't have places composing, that one place where you're reusing the code is now, okay, well, I call that from five different places, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the, that's the same problem we already had. So um, you choose, really. Uh, you have to explicitly annotate, I'm going to start to do this now, um, and then I'm done. I'm going to start to do this, et cetera. And it's going to nest all the way down, and you're going to get all this nice contextual information at the end. Uh, it's going to just emerge at runtime. Um, so you can, um, okay, so um, the requirement here basically is that we can't have, I have, log, I have a log function, I have the debug function on my logger, say, um, and I pass it where in my, what in my code, what my code's doing right now. I can't say log.debug 
running benchmarks, blah. And the reason I can't do that is because that means that the places are not composable inherently. If I'm hard coding it in there, that's all the information it's going to have. And that's not what we want. So um, uh, now that we have a statement of the problem we're facing, um, I'd like to take a little uh, moment to set up a kind of space where I can express a solution. Like what, what, what even is logging really? What does it mean to log something? Um, I'm going to start talking about what it means to log, what I think of when I think of logging. Uh, I'm going to start with just a simple logger to standard out after I introduce what I'm gonna, how I'm going to talk about logging in the first place. And then I'm going to add log levels and I'm going to add uh, the place where you're logging from. And none of these examples of loggers or pieces of logs and stuff like that, none of this is toys. All of this will end up reused in the uh, final application. Right, so uh, that's my promise right now. Uh, so, uh, also, all this code is available in Haskell as well. If you're interested, it's it's not even that much nicer because this is mostly very short. So, loggers are actually just triplets of functions. Let's say because we only have three log levels and every other log level is bad. Um, so, log we we have a debug function, info, and error. All of these take something to something. They take a log message, whatever a message is, and then they output it as an A, whatever an A is, right? They emit it, however we do that. Um, and also, um, we, can, we, can treat, we can create logs as if there's no such thing as log level. We can, be, okay, um, we can say there is a logger here that treats info error and debug all the same. You probably don't want to do this in production. Um, <laughs> in terms of you don't want to treat this as like that in your brain. You will use this code though, 100%. Um, so I'm keeping this completely generic, right? It's just a few functions. Um, all these functions are pure. So A can be IO of unit, and then you're outputting the log somewhere, and it's a side effect, right? But I don't need to know that now. It's not necessary. I mean, it, if it's an L to IO of unit, take the IO of unit, abstract it out to A, we're fine. I, I don't, there's, no, there's no reason to include it in the type. So um, there's, this is a more general notion of a logger than you're used to, I'm sure. Um, this is, you might think of this not necessarily as a logger, but as a pieces of a logger. Log LA is a piece of a logger, a stage of a logger even, if you will, which you're going to make loggers out of. Eventually, from the user perspective, you're going to have a log string IO unit. And they're going to pass it a string, and they're going to get some side effect back that they can use in their program. But for now, while we're constructing the logs, while we're talking about what else we can do with logs, compose them, etc., we're going to talk about them in an abstract way. Okay, so this um, there are a couple of type class instances for this type. Um, you might not be familiar with them; they're sort of less common because they're type classes for types with two parameters. A lot of people, you know, everyone knows func or applicative monad, but you know, this is for f of underscore, and we have an l of Two underscores, right? We have two, two type holes. Um, so in order to talk about both of the type parameters, we're going to need a type class that can talk about both of them. Um, so the first one I'd like to talk about is profunctor. Profunctor is also what I'm going to use the most often. Profunctor allows you to take preprocessors and postprocessors and add them to something. So I'm going to imagine I have some function which takes um, strings to, or oh, sorry some function which takes st strings to JSON, right? And I have a structured logger which takes JSON. And I have this string to JSON preprocessor, which basically says, OK, I know that you want a structured logging thing, but I have all the structure right now. You just need to provide me the message, OK? So you have this preprocessor which takes the string and puts it inside of your JSON. You have this logger which takes in JSON and gives you something. Um, and then you compose them together, and you've got a new logger which takes in strings does this preprocessing and then emits them, right? In the same way that the other, the, uh, the previous logger did. Um, and then you can think about postprocessors. Postprocessors like uh, I have a string that I'm being, that I'm emitting from this logger, right? And you wouldn't think of it normally as emitting a string, but if you have this string and a function from string to I/O of unit that say puts it in the file, puts it in the console, you can add that as postprocessing to your log that emits strings. So now you have a new log, right? So all you need to do to do this is, if you want to add post-processing 
uh, you add a function from A to B, and then you add it to the end of all of these L to A's, and now you have all L to B's, and it's a log LB, which is the same as map from functors. Um, and if you want to pre-process, you need a function from X to L, and you're going to add it before the debug info and error, and you're going to get functions from X to A, and then you're going to have a log X and A. Right? So this is so pro functors essentially what they let you do with logs is they let you, or loggers, is they let you take loggers and add pre-processing and post-processing, which is not different for each log level. Right? That's key, that's key to this, is it's going to be the exact same thing applied to every single log level. And you can see this here because Profunctor is specified in terms of DIMAP, which is add a preprocessor and a postprocessor. Um, so if you want to make a new version of your logging function, you just need to take the postprocessor, apply it to the whole result, and the preprocessor, and apply it to the input, and then you're done. Uh, and it does the exact same thing for all three of these, post, 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 pre, 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 they're all the same function. Um, and that means that each log level is treated the exact same by DIMAP, which is it, it's, it's nice to have because it means, it means that you, you aren't going to accidentally do different things for different log levels unless you really mean to. Here's another instance which I really like. It's the category of loggers. So there is a, there is a logging category. I don't know um, how much category theory the audience is familiar with, um, but essentially this just means that you can compose loggers. And what composing loggers means is you have some logger that takes in A's and emits B's, and you have some logger that takes in B's and emits C's, and you have one that takes in A's and emits C's. Uh, and that, the, what that gives you is if you consider the log, if you consider the logger that from B to C, you can consider this as a post processor for your logger from A to B. And the post processor is going to do something different for every single log level, right? So it's sort of getting back the extra power that we didn't have with Profunctor. So it's, as you can see, it's, it's calling f.debug of g.debug, right? Before we had post for every single one of them. Now it's f.debug, f.info, f.error. It's doing something different for every single log level. Okay, so, so what this lets you do is it lets you compose loggers that are aware of log level, or processors that are aware of log level. Sorry, does someone have a question? No? No. Okay, geez, tired. <laughs> um, okay, so, so this, is, this is why you can really read this as a sort of logger stage because this lets you compose logger stages in pretty much every way you, you might want to think to. Um, and that's why none of this code is going to be toys because everything which is really small is actually going to compose with other things. Um, okay, so let's move on to show you some, what, some actual logs. Uh, or actually, no. So first, this is a really fun exercise. There is a monad instance for loggers. Um, what it does is not incredibly useful. I recommend trying it out because it's very interesting. I haven't, I mean, I say not very useful. Really, I haven't used it. There are some uses for it. You can definitely come up with it. It's just another way to compose loggers, though. It's, it's not super interesting. Okay, so this is the first logger. Um, this is a logger which, I mean, do I even have to tell you? It's a logger which takes input log messages and puts the log level in front of them. This is what every, every logger framework is going to do this somehow, usually as part of this gigantic, huge piece of code which does a bunch of things at the same time to all of your log messages. Here it's just like, okay, no, if you want to take log messages and append the log level, here you go. This is it. You will never do this again. This is the only time you're ever going to have to do this. So the, the notion of emitting here is just, I return a string. It's not, you know, IO of unit or anything like that. Um, so they're going to be really emitted later by some other stage of the log or some post processor that's going to take that to I/O of unit probably. Um, so that's that's what this does. This all it does is very self-contained. Now I want to take that logger and I want to output everything to the console. Profunctor provides rmap. Rmap just adds pr post processors. I'm going to say take the logger after. Any, for any of the log levels, after you've finished converting it to a string, uh, to a string with the log levels added, 
um, just put it in the console. And console.putsterline is uh, it's from Scala's at 8 uh, IO library. You're probably not familiar with it, but just pretend like you, pretend like you are because it's not you know it's not hugely different from cat's effects IO or FS2's IO or just imagine that I'm wrapping console.println inside an IO action. So this is all you need to write a log which outputs the standard out. And in fact, if you want to write a logger stage, which will take a logger and make it output things to standard out, you don't need to because the post processor, console.putsterline, the function that already exists, that's all you need. You're going to rmap later. How could this possibly be more concise? Like, I don't think it could. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's continue to places. Uh, we can start with a simple idea of what place our code is executing. Uh, my conjecture for now is just going to be that all you need is a string. Uh, strings are a little, you know, you're always, I always feel a little uncomfortable when I incorporate strings into something when I'm doing that's functional. But I think f for most cases you can use it here. I'll, I'll go later, I'm going to go into something which is slightly more complicated. But for, for now, you know, they're just going to be for logs. That's all people need. They just need to see something, and that's all we're going to do. Um, uh, so to integrate this with the log, all we're going to do is we're going to add this as a parameter to the log. So our logs right now take strings as the log messages. Um, all we need to do is say our log takes in a string, which is the log message, and a string, which is the place we're, we're executing, or what we're doing right now. So log with place prepends the current place in the code to the log um, using Scala string interpolator syntax. If you can't understand that, it's, I can't help you, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, so console logger with place takes console log from earlier, which, which takes our log messages, appends the log level and puts it into the console. And it says, okay, before you do any of that, first I want you to log with place and to add the place that we're logging from into the log message. So now we have Nice log messages that have all these different parts that we've added separately. Um, and uh, this, this whole log with place blah tupled is just to get around the fact that this, this is a function with two arguments and that there is a function with one argument that's a tuple. It's just boilerplate. It's Scala. Uh, it's part of the standard library. Yes, uh, yeah, if you give it a function with two parameters, it will give you a function that takes in a tuple of those parameters. Oh, so it's, like uh, it's not like uncurry, because that takes a function that returns a function and gives you a function with two arguments. I mean, it's, it's like uncurry. They're both like things that help you get around the fact that currying is not the default in Scala, um, and that tuples aren't the same as currying. So, uh, yeah. Sorry? LMAP, yes, yeah, so LMAP is the, the profunct, so profunctors have DIMAP, which adds a preprocessor and a postprocessor. They have LMAP, which just adds a preprocessor, and RMAP, which adds a postprocessor. So our preprocessing here is, first, before you do any of the console log stuff, I want you to add the place we're executing, or what we're doing right now. Yes? It is not a profunctor because how do you take an either, um, it's not a profunctor because it's covariant in both of its type arguments. That probably doesn't answer too much. It's covariant in both. Profunctors are covariant in one and contravariant in the other. Uh, because preprocessors are, I have, let me go back to the profunctor instance. The pre right here, you, you, you go from C to A, but you have a log AB. Okay, so your A becomes a C because you have a function from C to A that's backwards, right? But for either, you need to have both an you need to have an A to B and the or an A to C and a B to D instead. Yeah. Uh, the, not exactly. It's it's just that the one of them has to have maps. One of them has to have the function argument uh, flipped. Okay. Yes, that's it. Yes. Yeah, if you, if you have, if you have, if it's covariant in both, like it is with either, like it is with tuple two, uh, like pairs, uh, that's a bifunctor. This is a profunctor. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay. Um, now, you may be wondering, okay, Edmund, uh, you said that you had this huge problem where you had to compose all of these places and you had to somehow plumb them into places. 
Um, you haven't done any plumbing at all. You haven't even done anything, really. I mean, this is like, this is nothing, right? There's no code here. There's no, there's no logic. There's no meaning. It's, it's just, you know, put the place in front of the message. That's all it is. How do you actually get the place there? I want to pass a log message to my logger. I don't want to pass a log message and a place. That was kind of the point, wasn't it? So yes, that's true. And I'm going to spend a little, a little while now on, uh, on how to fix that. And that's the reader T part. So I'm going to start by telling you that I'm a big fan of explicitly passing arguments to functions. Okay? If you have a function, the only things you should do with it are pass an argument to it or uh, compose it with other functions. What you shouldn't be doing is having, um, oh, well, I picked it out from some scope up there and it's kind of got its way in here magically, or there's some runtime injection or something like that. I'm, I'm really not a fan. I don't really like that at all. Um, I'm sure that the, there's, some, there's, some there's a lot of logger stuff that works that way. Uh, none of this is going to work that way. Um, so um, what, are you, what am I going to do then with this function that takes in a place and a message and so that I don't have to pass in the place? Like, how do I not explicitly pass this argument? Well. I'm going to have to use function composition. I'm going to have to somehow hide away this argument so that it's used correctly but doesn't get in my face. Um, and composes, most importantly. Um, I want to make places out of smaller places. I want to you know, make the things I'm doing out of, OK, well, I'm doing this, well, I'm doing this, well, I'm doing this. Um, so uh, when it comes to doing this, when it comes to avoiding passing an argument to a function that we know we're going to pass later, Reader T is, is exactly what we need. Reader T is just a function, right? Reader T uh, takes three type parameters, uh, but in the end, it's just a function from E to F of A, and that's it. Uh, and it provides some nice little tools that you can use to compose functions with it and compose it with, with other Reader Ts. Uh, but that's not, it's not magic, it's just functions. Um, and the only nice thing that I, uh, the only reason I'm using Reader T and not just using a function is because I also want the monad instance for reader t, because reader t, um, given a monad, is also a monad. So I'll, I'll talk about that more later. Um, so um, all of this code already that takes in the place explicitly, it's still going to work with reader t. Uh, the thing is, though, that we're going to first sort of uh, decouple those two things. We're going to decouple the fact that our logger takes in a place and the fact that we're going to have this place machinery all over the place that's going to um, compose things and stuff. So reader t, reader t is a function. Um, reader t f e a e to f of a. It's just a function that yields some effects, right? And the important thing about this is flatten. Flatten is a particular way to compose functions, right? It's okay. I need. I have a function from an argument, uh, one argument type e, that yields another function, which also takes that argument type e, uh, ignoring the effects part for a second. And the, the easiest way to deal with this is to just pass this, is to create a new function, and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to pass the argument in, get the, new f get the function on the inside, and I'm going to pass the same argument to that function. So it's just function composition in a way that lets you um, duplicate your argument. Question? Is flatten what Scala calls join? Scala Z calls it join. I'm just flat. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. This is like more English or something? Yes. Well, it's, it's not even valid Scala. Well, because nothing is in like a, a scope, and I haven't put like object reader t, put def flatten, and blah, blah, blah. It's convenient Scala. I swear it all probably compiles, though. Uh, so yeah, so th this, uh, all we need to do is, uh, my explanation earlier of uh, you, you feed in the argument twice, uh, all you need to do is that, plus you need to flat map. So you, need, so you have an e to f of, e to f of a. You pass in the argument twice, you have an f of f of a flatten it because you have a monad for f. Now you have an f of a, and you're done, right? So this, this lets you duplicate arguments. Uh, and this is useful because most of the time, when you're logging uh, and you have these different places, right, when you do something and then you do something else, uh, inside of some, while you're doing, I need another word other than doing. Um, if you if you have something, if you have one step and another step inside a bigger process, right, you're going to, that process is doing something, okay, and those steps all want to know what it's doing so that when they log, they can pass what it's doing to the logger. 
And flat map is going to duplicate that and be like, okay, well, I'm doing this step, and that's going to take this argument. And then this other step is going to take the same argument, duplicating it. Right? So that's, that's why, um, that's why reader t's flatten and, and flat map are, are useful for us here. Here's local. Local is, is literally just function composition. I even wrote it as function composition just in case that makes it easier because it's just I have an n e to e and I have an e to f of a. I'm going to take that n e to e and I'm going to apply it to an n e and get back my f of a um, by, by using the resulting e to call the function. Um, so all this is doing is saying, okay, I have this, um, I'm going to pass in this, in this e, right, as a function, in the, into the function. Uh, but I would like to actually transform it from an ne first, because I have an ne in my hands and also a way to go from ne to e. Uh, and what this does for us is, when you use local, um, you say, okay, given this argument, do something to it. And in our case, it's going to be add an extra uh, nested place which we're do that we're doing right now or, or inside right now. So the code inside this, this RT right here, so that the effect yielded by RT in there, the E is going to be something that has the extra information that says, okay, uh, when I, you can use, I'll show a code example later, but what it's doing is it's just going to, we're going to use it to add extra places on to our sort of stack of places that, we're, that we are in our code, the things we're doing. Ask. Ask is really simple. It's just give me an E. I'm going to give you back the E, except with no effects. So it's, it's, if, a, if it wasn't an effectful function, this would just be the identity function. All we're doing is adding pure. Um, so this is useful because every time you're inside a reader T, um, and you want to grab out the current where am I place, um, you need to get an E out somehow. And that's how you're going to do it, because the E is going to be an E that you were passed from a, uh, a higher level function, which is calling you. So here is the version of that, that earlier framework that incorporates this. Okay, So this is, this is the code part with the local, right? Um, all of this, uh, I also added in something else. Reader T happens to be pretty annoying to use, especially in Scala. It's a lot of syntax, um, and also it's not very abstract. I don't want to require that my framework uses Reader T. I want to require that my framework uses something with the same operations as Reader T. I want to have ask and local, right? Um, but I don't want to necessarily say it's Reader T because it could be either T over Reader T, or it could be something which implements the Reader T's interface, but which isn't the same. Uh, implementation of that interface. Um, so instead, I'm using a monad reader. Monad reader is just saying uh, this is. I know this is Scala syntax. Sorry, but uh, monad reader of this is going to give us a monad reader of f and string. So that means that we're going to be able to say ask is going to give us an f of string. So just substituting reader t f e for our f. So we have f of string and we have local, which is going to go. Um, uh, if you have a function from string to string, it's going to give you a function from f of a to f of a, which is going to say, okay, well, inside that f of a now, the string, the string function has been applied to the string that they got. So everywhere here, all these functions, all these steps, I have added a local call, which is going to add to the uh, add to the start. I'm going to I'm setting up right now and an arrow. Um, which is just my delimiter of like, okay, well, I'm doing this and doing this. The arrow is and. So inside of setup, now setup.local, blah, 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 anyway, when we use ask, we're going to get back a string that includes the word setup. Okay, and then we can pass that to our logger, and then our logger is going to say, okay, uh, we were doing this and this and this at the time, and it's done, right? So I, I've got different annotations for all the different parts here, uh, and it, it doesn't matter how I crash, it doesn't matter how I, uh, it doesn't matter what my log messages are. They're all going to be prefixed by this information, with other machinery, which I'm going to show.
So uh, logging with place, right? We need to have a logger that does this for us because I don't want to call ask and then unwrap, you know, the, get the S, get the string out of it, take the string, pass it into this, tu this fu function that takes tuples and then log that and then, no, nah, I don't want to do that. Uh, what I would like to do, however, is pass my logger just a message, a log message, and it should figure out absolutely everything else for me. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, what I had earlier, console log with place, which is the uh, logger takes in two strings, gives you an IO unit. And I'm going to automatically pass in that place part. Okay, so this is what I want, right? I would like something which takes a string and gives me some reader T, which will con uh, consume that place and then, um, and then print it out. Um, what I have, though, is something which takes in two strings. Um, and this is just the signature of reader T, just to remind you of what exactly I'm trying to do here. Um, and what exactly I'm trying to do here, really, is I'm trying to go um, from string to reader T IO string unit. And what I have is, and if I take that and I unwrap reader T, now what I have is string to string to IO unit. That's just a curried, curried function. If I take the arguments, uncurry them, now I have a function from two strings to an IO of unit. And if I just tuple the arguments, now I'm at exactly, this is exactly what my logger already does, right? So now, all I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come up with this function that's gonna say, okay, well, pass me this, func this logger function which takes in a tuple, and I'm going to give you another logger function which takes in a single argument and returns in reader t. Um, so that what that what that'll do then is essentially what we're doing is we're taking the pre-processing stages, right? The pre-processing stages touch the strings, two strings, right? We don't want that to happen. We want to be able to tr talk about it on the on the right hand. What it's producing. What you're producing is something dependent on the place. You're not consuming the place, right? So this is this is the the sort of insight here, and that's it's basically just currying and uncurrying. That's all it is, and tupling arguments and stuff like that. It's plumbing. It's just plumbing stuff. Uh, and, and reader log is the, are going to be our console logger that has log levels, that has our place log, that produces a reader T. And so we just call convert log function on all of those log levels. And then what we're going to get back is our logger that does exactly what we want, um, which is uh, it's going to implicitly not implicitly exactly, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to grab the nearest scope that says, hey, this is what I was doing, and it's going to push that out in the logs. Any questions? Kind of went a little fast. No? Okay. Um, so, um, now, who passes the function to the function composer, right? Um, the function composer being the framework. Um, we have just solved an issue where we had this function argument that we were going to pass everywhere and manipulate it by hand and was going to be incredibly unwieldy. Um, and we just factored it out into reader t, and now we don't need to do that anymore. Um, and we fixed the problem, but now we have another problem. The framework needs to take in the logger, even though the framework does not use the logger, right? I mean. Why would we need to do that when we don't even know really that we don't even know that our functions take in the logger itself, right? All, all, all we know about our functions is that our setup function is an, or, set, or our setup is an f of i, right? Where do you plug a logger into an f of i? Um, nowhere. There's, there's no holes. Um, so what you need to do then is you need to do the same thing that we just did with the scope with the logger itself. We need to plumb the logger around using the same machinery, function composition. That's it. Um, so everything is still fully explicit. It's just that it's, it's explicit in a way which does not uh, interfere with your reasoning and which is abstract and decoupled. And uh, I mean, if we can come up with a benchmarking framework and we, we can come up with a logging framework, and we can integrate the two of them without code changes to either of them, I think we're doing better than like 99% of Java programs. Like, I don't, I don't think you can write a benchmarking framework without having a logging framework and you do the runtime injection stuff and blah, blah, blah. This is just, uh, this is just how it works. It all falls out of just composing things. 
however, though, the, there's a difference between the scope and the logger you might hear. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of there's a tendency in the in the Scala FP community and also kind of in Haskell, but not so much uh, in Scala FP. A lot of the times, people will say, "Well, I'm only going to do one, I'm only going to have one logger. My whole program is going to have just one logger, probably, right? So why don't I just make it into a type class, right? What is the logging type class? Well, it, um, you know, it's log of uh, L and A. There's only going to be one way to log from L to A. Um, we, we already kind of know that's not true. But let's say that the logger that goes from string to F of unit, that's totally unique in our program. We're only going to have one of those. Um, the issue is, though, um, that it's not going to be the same. That's n <laughs> you think it's going to be the same until it isn't the same. Or you think it's going to be the same until you need to. Um, you think it's going to be the same, and it doesn't actually make your code any cleaner because now you're instead of saying I'm going to take in a logger type param a logger parameter, you say I'm going to take in a type parameter, and I need a, a type class instance for logger. The only thing that has happened though is that when you call functions that also need the logger, they're going to you're not going to need to pass it to them explicitly. That's the one difference, right? And it has a huge cost because it means that your whole application can only have one logger. Uh, and if you factor it out later, you're in for a world of hurt in Scala anyway. In Haskell, it's not as much of an issue. Um, so let's try to abstract a bit then. Let's try to abstract over our, our framework needs to know about logging scopes. Our functions need to know about the logger. And let's plumb both the logger and the logging scope through reader t at the same time without exposing too much information to either part. So let's, let's come up with the, the simple solution, which is, OK, well, we want a logger and a scope, um, oh, scope being place, you know, what we're doing. Scope, I find, is a nicer, nicer way to put it. If you're familiar at all with Emacs Lisp, Probably not. Maybe some of the Emacs users in the audience. But there's this thing called dynamic scope where uh, you can call a function, and then the function can access all the variables you defined. And then once you return, the function that you return to can't access any of your variables. Right? So it's dynamic scope. We're doing the exact same thing. Like If you pass around in your reader t a map from string to any or object or whatever you're used to, that is actually dynamic. You've, impl you've implemented Elisp's dynamic scoping of variables. It's just incredibly unsafe and a bad idea. But you've done it. Uh, and that's, that's, that's how the propagation works. That's the, that's the way to, to, to understand that. Um, so we have logger and scope, right? We can't directly use logger and scope with reader t. Because if we do, our framework's going to say, hey, I have a logger here. And our code is going to say, hey, I have a, I have a scope here, um, which I'm not going to touch. I'm just going to touch the logger. And this, this generalizes. I mean, this isn't too bad an issue. Um, but it is an issue once your, your client code, your, your benchmark stuff, can't be changed by you. And you can't just change the data type to include extra stuff or remove extra stuff. Because then you're going to have to convert between things yourself and pull values out of things and push values back into things. And it's a, it's a giant pain. So um, we're going to abstract over this, right? Um, we're going to say, OK, well, I have some S of, um, oh, my code's not, OK. Pretend that there's no S of L and A, just S, OK? Just S, just S. S can only contain a logger of L and A. L and A is part of has logger, OK? So you can say, OK, I have an S. I want to grab the logger out from the S, OK? And you can also say, I have an S. I want to change the logger inside so that later on, it's kind of like, kind of reminiscent of local, but it's, it's a modify, it's just a modification function which takes, okay, this, this, it says this field, I'm going to modify the value and create a new S. So what that gives you is, you say that you have one logger everywhere, but if you want to modify your logger with this function from logger to logger, you can do it. It's totally fine, it's possible. Um, and has scope is the same thing. It's um, given this big S type, which we can instantiate as, as, as logger and scope, right? We're, we're thinking about doing this with logger and scope. Um, and you can just take the scope out and modify it and put it back in. You can take the logger out, modify it, and put it back in, right? This is, this is generally referred to in, in the Haskell uh, community as, as classy lenses. 
because it's when I provide get and modify, I'm giving you a lens, and it's classy because it's in type classes and also because it looks nice. So now we've we've abstracted this right. Um, the framework needs has scope. The functions being logged need uh, has log, uh, and now we can come up with this beautiful bit of code, which is going to take our, which is going to be the exact same as before, except instead of using strings as our scope, or instead of using strings as our environment for the reader t, the argument to reader t is, is frequently called an environment. Instead of saying the environment is a string, we just say the environment has a string. And this is extensible because later on we can say the environment has something else. Uh, and we can call both of those things from a bigger function which knows more about what that environment contains. So all the local calls here, instead of just saying local, add this little piece of information to the scope, it's local, take that environment, modify the scope, add this information. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the only change you need. And now you have a uh, benchmarking framework that works with this sort of scope management framework doesn't touch or talk to or even know about the logging framework. You could put them in entirely different modules, repositories, whatever, uh, and that's, that's fine. Um, so uh, this generalizes extremely well. Like, it's, it's crazy. People, people use this all over the place in Haskell. People will put their own, um, people will use this has stuff for um, uh, database uh, access, right? Because you know you, you only have one database in your program now. Eventually, you won't. Um, you 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 and you don't want to manually um, plumb all these things around as okay. I have a reader T of database. You want to say I have a reader T of something with database in it. You can add to it later. You can subtract from it, and uh, no one's going to need to manually convert between these uh, types. So. Um, that's, that's basically done. That's, that's how that code looks for good now, I swear. Um, and uh, when it comes to errors and crashes, though, you, have, you can do a couple things which are language specific. You can do something like in, in Scala, you can take the whole, um, instead of using local and modify scope, you're also going to do something which says catch exceptions inside of this IO thing, and then um, take the exceptions and add the scope information to them if there's not scope information already present. And then at the top level of your program, you can say, OK, well, if I'm going to catch all exceptions, because uh, you, you always have to have that you know, catch all loop at the top, or not loop, but uh, try at the top. And uh, you can just say, given a normal exception, blah, given an exception with a scope, print it out for the user. And all exceptions should be scoped. You never know, but they should all be scoped. And you can print it out. And then you know exactly what your program was doing when it crashed. Um, Another thing you can do with this um, is you can talk about per, uh, performance with this. You can build profilers into, uh, into your, your, your program, uh, but not at the stack trace level, at the doing stuff level. Um, am I running out of time here? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, you just, you just uh, take, that, uh, take some timer function, uh, which is also going to have the place argument. Do the exact same thing, um, and then you're, uh, you're going to have performance info uh, you can also change the string to list of string because then you have like uh, it's it's easier to see. I, I I did this and it took 400 milliseconds and part of it took 100 and part of it took 300. Uh, so that's the that's the alternate scope type I was talking about. But uh, anyway, that uh, that is it. Um, there is a short short addendum I was going to go through, but uh, I don't think I have any time, so I'm just going to move to questions. Thanks.